Now, the entire earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar means the tooth of the city, the tooth of the city. And it may have to do with the geographical configurations in Mesopotamia of the Fertile Crescent with the Tigris and the Euphrates River, rivers and their tributaries and so forth, forming a point that resembled the human tooth where the tower was built. It may be that. That is one educated against by the scholars. If you were to go to this area today, now it's known as the Sha'at al-Arab, you would see that that would be a perfectly viable explanation as to why the term Shinar is used. And it, they said to one another, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. What we have here is the following. It is very much like what happened with the fall of man. After the saga of Noah, God begins again, but the same thing happens. Man could not have access to the tree of life. God could not allow fallen man to live in sin forever. He had to do something. He let man reap the consequences of what he did, which was death. The wages of sin is death. But of course, praise God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Death was never God's plan or wish. He knew man would fall, but it was never his plan. God never wanted death. He only wanted life. God never wanted dark. He only wanted light. God never wanted pain. He only wanted pleasure. He never wanted hate and strife. He only wanted love and peace. Enter Satan. Man has fallen. God could not allow man to continue to live forever, to have access to the tree of life in that state. Access to the tree of life could only come after redemption through Christ. So now it happens again. Nothing will be impossible for them. We have to understand that we are imagio dei beings. We are made in the image and likeness of God. Left to our own devices, we will always try to challenge God with the misuse of our intellect, with the misuse of technology, and so forth. Now, why do I point this out? What happened in Babel at the tower is happening again. The high-tech revolution in everything from biogenetic engineering to microelectronics, man is going to think that he does not need the Almighty, that he can deify himself and be his own God and get rid of Judeo-Christianity. Now, obviously, this is Satan again. This is Satan, but man will attempt to do this. This will be very much the reality of what's happening. And as I've pointed out before, and our teaching on understanding Babylon, that already you can take a cell phone, and on the cell phone, you can ask somebody in, in Tokyo, do you know where there's a restaurant with Western, with Italian food? And you put it in an English, and it will come up on the screen in Japanese for them, and they will answer in Japanese, and you can read it in English or French or whatever. Well, this is man trying to, with success, and not necessarily with bad motive, reverse a curse that God has placed. Man trying to usurp what God has said. Now, this points to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. The pronouncements of God cannot be allowed 
to be superseded by the designs of man, particularly not the designs of man under the influences of Satan. But that is what is happening. As godlessness increases and technology increases, you're going to have a convergence of these things, and it already exists. There's a spiritual reason on back of the things we see happening now, increasingly. Uh, that's just one example, is in the area of, of language. Another is, of course, longevity. It is only the third world that is keeping average life expectancy below 80 years. In the developed world, it's going beyond the limit God has sent. Jesus must come. God cannot allow man in a fallen state to have or achieve these things. Now, in Christ, redeemed man, redeemed man can come into these blessings and more, but not independent of God and not with sin. This all begins with the Tower of Babel. Now, here the historical book of Jadish comes into play and, and does help us. The book of Jadish, of course, is not canonical. It is not a source of doctrine by any means, but it is a valid historical account of certain things concerning the background of the scriptures. And we know what with Semiramis and Nimrod and so forth, false religion was born in Babylon. Astrology came from Babylon. That is why if you look at the Chinese horoscope or the Hindu horoscope or the Greek horoscope that we use in the West, it all follows the same pattern. It all has the same source. The deities of Babylon simply took different names in different cultures and different geographical localities, but they had their origins there in Babylon. Well, let's go a bit further with this. Babylon meant in its own language, gate of the gods, gate of the gods, El being God, Bab being gate, okay? Even in modern Arabic, you say Bab is gate. However, in Hebrew, it's different. In Hebrew, Nobody is exactly sure, but there is some kind of a wordplay almost. In Hebrew, levavel, to confuse. Levavel, to confuse. Remember that rather pernicious character in the Old Testament, uh, Ishkobival, Ishkabibel, the confused man or the man of confusion. Uh, type of the Antichrist, but not our subject now, uh, this confusion. God confused their tongue. God intervened. Now, some, some scholars theorize that the Tower of Babel would have been near the Temple of Nebo in, in Borsipa in modern Iraq. Some think that. But we have references to Shinar, in Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, and certainly in Zechariah 5, 11, which we address in our teaching, uh, the woman in the basket or the bimbo in the basket. She was at Shinar where the unclean birds came and took it away. Now, that part of Zechariah, is about the future, is eschatological. It relates to the book of Revelation with the unclean birds. Hence, what happened initially in Babylon at the tower has a future prophetic meaning, according to Zechariah. And again, it is not a coincidence that Shinar is mentioned in Daniel, Isaiah, and Joshua. So we have this. Now, this is the aftermath, of course, of the floods, the aftermath of the floods. Man goes into reprobation. God has to stop it. Adam and Eve are evicted from the garden. The flood comes, okay? The confusion of the languages comes. God will never allow man made in God's image and likeness to become his own God. 
it wouldn't work anyway. All he would be doing is being a servant of Satan. Auto deification works in our mind, but Satan knows it will ultimately be to his glorification. And that will take place literally in the person of Antichrist. But I digress. Let us continue. Civilizations, anthropologically, with no connection with each other, either anthropologically or geographically, have flood narratives. You have the uh, Arata accounts of the Sumerians, like Ararat, okay? We, of course, have the famous Epic of Gilgamesh. We have in Nepal, Mexico, Botswana, and Africa, and even North American Cherokee Indians all have variations of this same account of the flood. Now, the one that's in the Hebrew Scriptures is obviously the historically most historically accurate and theologically correct one, but other people knew these things happened. And this is supported by geomorphology. We've even found things like fossils of mollusks, you know, um, shellfish from from the oceans in the Gobi Desert, thousands of miles from it. Uh, There is substantial geological (coughs) and fossil evidence for the historicity of the flood. Nonetheless, once again, I digress. So we have Babylon. Now, this general location of Babylon, okay, this general location of Babylon uh, sees the rise of the city-state of Babylon that mushrooms into the Babylonian Empire. We're speaking from the 19th to the 15th centuries before Christ. The location of this is at um, Hila Bavil, which is about 53, 55 miles south of of Baghdad in, in, in modern Iraq. People know where it was. Saddam Hussein built a palace there that was leveled by the American Air Force. Nonetheless, the Babylonian Empire emerges where the Tower of Babel was. False religion is born. Astrology is born. This is the first city of Satan. The first city of Satan. And its influence permeated the rest of the world, (coughs) radiating from Babylon. But then something happens. Something later would take place. We read about the demise of the Babylonian Empire as predicted by Isaiah in chapters uh, 44 and 45 and predicted by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 51. God knew the Babylonian captivity was going to happen because of the sin of Judah Nonetheless, he predicted the destruction of the Babylonian Empire before that happened, and he predicted it would happen not only at the hands of the Persians, but he names the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, 200 years before Cyrus was born in the book of Isaiah. This happens in 539 BC. Babylon falls to Cyrus the Great. Okay. And a conflict begins to happen. Cyrus and Darius the Mede, who are the partner country or partner nation with the Babel, with the uh, Persians, were benevolent towards the Jews, and they took on Jewish influence. There were eventually similarities between Zoroastrianism and Judaism. Things you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the sons of light, the sons of darkness. One God, personal accountability to God for one's own moral conduct. Things like this, 
Zoroastrianism then, or, or Zarathustraism then, was not like it is now, where it gets into a kind of fire veneration. The Magi, the Magi came because of the influences of Judaism on Persia. So what began as a strategic conflict, followed by a political one, began to take another shape after 539. What we know is the following. In Babylon, in the Babylonian Empire, <coughs> you had a situation where the economy and the government and the religion, the pagan religion, the demonic religion, <coughs> were all intertwined. The center of this was the ziggurat of Marduk. Marduk <coughs> being one of the main, main idols of the ancient Near East. He takes different names in different countries at different times, but it's Marduk worship. <coughs> the Chaldee Magi originally came from this, but they taught that the king, the king was the of, of, <coughs> of Babylon, or the emperor of Babylon was the son of God. <coughs> was the son of God. Right away you have a conflict. The promised Messiah of the Jews would be the son of God. But you have other civilizations beginning with Babylon claiming the same thing. <coughs> now Satan knew this from the book of Isaiah chapter 9. The Messiah would be God's <coughs> son. But the Greeks would begin to teach that Hercules was the son of Zeus. Even the Egyptians had a deification of Pharaoh and a relationship with the god Ra, the main deity of, of, of ancient Egypt. Now, again, you have the same kind of thing. Whatever Ra meant, it had to do something with the sun, apparently, in Egypt. But the Hebrew word Ra means evil. Quite a situation. You always find false religion counterfeiting truth. Always find it counterfeiting truth. So this goes on until 480 B.C. The Persians are not taking any more. They have their own beliefs. They are influenced by the beliefs of the Jews. And the now occupied Babylonians are beginning to scheme politically and using their religion to do it. So in 480 B.C., the Persians cracked down, and the Medes cracked down. Okay. What happens? The 300 priests of Babylon, worshippers of Marduk and so on, relocate, they migrate westward to Pergamum. Pergamum, the second city of Satan. Now, Babylon literally moved. It literally moved. Something happens. Eventually, with Alexander the Great, the Greeks defeat the Persians. And the Atlid dynasty from the third to the second century emerges. So now a religion that had been Babylonian becomes Hellenized. It becomes the basis of Greek religion. Now at Pergamon had a convergence of Mithras of worship from Egypt and so forth from the four directions, they collided at Pergamum. We deal with this on our teaching filmed in Turkey on the seven churches. If you look at the, the, the location teachings on the internet and go to the teaching on Pergamum, 
we film this on location and I show you archaeologically from the photos and the film footage what how these things happened and you can actually see the different uh, in the archaeology the different idols and how they were worshipped be that as it may something happens with this Atali dynasty Atalius the third in 133 BC hands the whole thing over to Rome now from Pergamum it's already gone into Athens and into other cities in Greece. Greece at that time was not a unified country. It was made up of polices, city-states. Athens being one, Sparta being another, and so forth. But under the military prowess of Philip of Macedonia, followed by his son Alexander, there was a kind of cohesion until the Romans eventually came to power. Uh, Archimedes, the genius, tried to stop the Romans in, in Sicily. Uh, the east of Sicily had originally been Greek, not Italian. Uh, and that's where it happened. But finally, Rome prevailed. As we always say, Rome defeated Greece strategically. Greece defeated Rome culturally. And Rome begins to take on these deities, these Hellenized deities, Greek deities, which were originally Babylonian from Pergamum. Pergamum becomes the door of Babylonian mystery religion, as they were called, into Western civilization. It went in all directions, but we're talking about Western civilization. Pergamum was the door. Let's understand this even further. A lot happened at Pergamon. It was an important city. It was an important place. And it had a seminal influence in several areas, not just religion, but everything else rotated or centered around their religious beliefs. This was Pergamon. And you always had, always had, this relationship between science and false religion, philosophy of man and false religion, and this took on political, economic, and strategic nuances. It was all integrated. The philosophy, the science, the politics, and economics were integrated the same as they were in Babylon. You have the Temple of Marduk in Babylon, then in Pergamum it becomes something else. It becomes the altar of Zeus. The Romans called Zeus Jupiter, identifying him with the biggest planet. To the Greeks, he lived on top of Mount Olympus. He was the father of Hercules, who was half human and half divine. But the great altar, the place where he was worshipped, you couldn't go up Mount Olympus. The main place Zeus was worshipped was in Pergamum. Jesus refers to it. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, as you're familiar, what Jesus said about Pergamum. Let's look at the book of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, please. To the angel of Pergamum in verse 12, the church of Pergamum, write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. Now, 
again, if you go to our teaching on the seven churches, we explain what the two-word sword means in some depth. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And of course, Christians were martyred there, and the church was seduced there. Notice at Pergamum, there was persecution. Jesus again says, it's where Satan dwells in verse 13. But also, what Jesus compared to the teaching of Balaam and Balak, that is the spiritual seduction of the church. And this, of course, has the roots of transubstantiation and the cannibalism of the mass and the idolatry. Eating food sacrificed to idols, this, of course, goes back to the saga of Elijah, those who eat at Jezebel's table. Later, Jesus would say, Jezebel beguiles his servants to eat food sacrificed to idols in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. But it begins here. Pergamum is where idolatry first began to enter the church with the paganism of the Greco-Roman world first made inroads into the church. It would take off on a wider scale in Ephesus. By the 5th century, Ephesus, that became the place where Mary was proclaimed the queen of heaven, and they just took the title given to Artemis or Diana of Ephesus and ascribed it to Mary, the mother of Christ. But the incipient influence of this seduction of the church came from Pergamum, where Satan's throne is. You will always see those two things, Antipas, my servant, where Satan dwells, persecution of the church, and seduction of the church. As Revelation would later say, the dragon and the serpent, the persecutor and the seducer, the serpent that beguiles the woman. This is Pergamum. But a lot more happens at Pergamum. Not long after John wrote Revelation, and the Lord Jesus warned what it was, that it was the throne of Satan. It was the gateway of the pagan religions of Babylon into the Greco-Roman world. Now it becomes the gateway of the pagan religions of Babylon into the church. Same place. Well, let's understand another aspect of this. There was Galen of Pergamum. Galen of Pergamum, not long after. This is absolutely remarkable and incredible what the scripture tells us concerning Galen of Pergamum. Galen of Pergamum was truly a great physician by the standards of the ancient world. He really was. He was remarkable in his professionalism. But not only was he a physician who advanced the study of anatomy considerably in those days, but he was a philosopher. The philosophies of the fallen world. Well, what happens with Galen of Pergamum? He's born about 129 in Pergamum, in the early patristic age, the period right after the apostles. Okay, He comes out of the city, and you can still visit the clinic of Escrepus in Pergamum, where the medical symbol, the Skidus, Skidus, Skidus comes from the staff with the intertwined snake. That's where this comes from. Now, their view of healing was not only physiological or pharmacological, it was philosophical and metaphysical. Formulated by Galen at Pergamum, right underneath the altar of Zeus. The altar of Zeus is on the Acropolis looking down at the city, but 
at the foot of this hill, this elevated uh, plateau where the altar was located of, of Zeus. Down in its shadow was the clinic of Asclepius. This is what was taught by Galen. There are four body fluids that govern what people are. He said they were the yellow bile, the dark bile, <laughs> and, and, and the blood, and the phlegm. That's what he said. Well, advanced to the late 20th century. Personality profiling. The phlegmatic, the sanguine, the choleric, and the melancholic. And there were churches who got into that stuff back in the 1990s. And some of them still are. But it all goes back to Pergamum. In other words, long before Freud there was a metaphysical interpretation of behavior that was seen as clinical, but it was based on bogus biochemistry, bogus physiology. Now, we don't discount the contributions to clinical anatomy made by Gallen. He was a true pioneer of medical science in the ancient world like Hippocrates was and so forth. But he had this philosophical influence that was metaphysical. Something that was, we know this is chemically and physiologically baseless, determines the personality types and affects the health and so forth of a person based on these four bodily fluids. These things are not new. It was another physician, an unbelieving Jew in Vienna, who would pioneer psychiatric medicine, Sigmund Freud. Now understand something. Those aspects of psychiatric medicine that are physiologically based Neurology, endocrinology, hormones, hyperthyroidism. There are organic factors that affect behavior and health. Absolutely. But they have a legitimate basis. Most of psychology, including Clinical psychology, however, has no quantitative basis. Carl Jung was somebody involved in the occult. He had a, probably a familiar spirit. He believed the spiritual property of man was only a function of the mind, which he called the collective unconscious. Yet Maslow and these other people there was a disassociation between medical physiology, between organic reality, biochemically, and health and behavior. You had that which was legitimately organically based and that which was not. This goes back to Pergamum. What you see happening today with the pseudo science of psychology. Again, I'm not talking about neuropsychology or biopsychology. I'm talking about psychology. That's in the school system. It's in, it's in education. It has corrupted psychiatric medicine to a great degree. It's in consumer advertising. It's in everything. It has a pseudoscientific basis. 
This mind science that detaches behavior from what man is physiologically and from what man is spiritually is bogus science. Now, it's not a subject now, but remember, God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul. What people are psychologically is a homogeneous or homogeneous combination of what we are spiritually and what we are organically. Animals, their consciousness is only organic. With us, it's a mixture of the organic and spiritual. Remember, mental illness does not begin in the mind. If somebody is mentally ill, there's either something wrong organically or there's something wrong spiritually or both. It's a pseudoscience. Yet this pseudoscience of psychology permeates modern thoughts. Mind control of the masses. Propaganda works that way. Political propaganda works that way. Uh, Olinskyism works that way. Goebbels work that way. Lends itself to manipulation and population control, brainwashing, religious brainwashing. But its origins were not with Goebbels or Saul Olinsky. Its origins go back to Pergamum. They had a metaphysical view of human consciousness and health influenced by pagan religion that they falsely asserted was physiologically based based on phlegm and blood and bile. That's where Satan's throne is. I've often said, and I was not the first one, and I'm not the only one. Thank God for Deidre Bopkins and her husband. Thank God for some of the excellent books Dave Hunt wrote. Thank God for, for, for Christian psychologists who saw through it and came out of it. I'm referring to the fact that modern psychology, modern psychology is bogus science and a lot of it, 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 it's all bogus, but I'm not speaking again of neuropsychology or biopsychology or legitimate psychiatric medicine. I'm speaking of pure psychology. It's non-quantitative. It's bogus science. It is rife with superstition. Unsupported basis, chemically, but also, there's a spiritual delusion in it. Hypnotism is a cult. It's demonic. Now, we achieve this, of course, by hip hypnotic means, but also by hypnotic drugs, methoquelune and things like this. But the mass demonization you see in Iran with the Shia Muslims, or what Hitler did when he swayed the people with his speeches, him and Goebbels and so forth. This is mass demonization. It is mass psychological manipulation. It is demonic. These things came from the city of Satan. They came from where Satan's throne is, Jesus said. And that city was Pergamum. Pergamum was Babylon too. Now it gets even more interesting. Some of you are aware of this, that Turkey and Germany were allies in the First World War. They were very close fighting the British and the French and the whole history of General Allenby and the military disaster in Gallipoli and the Dardanelles and uh, it, it, 
the victory by the Australian and New Zealand cavalry in Beersheba, uh, where, where British Commonwealth forces and Aussies and Kiwis were fighting on biblical lands. <laughs> and Jerusalem was eventually liberated by Allenby, and the Jews were allowed to return the Aliyah. These things were all military and political reflections of what was happening spiritually. We have other tapes or other teachings going into these issues. Nonetheless, you had this alliance of Turkey and Germany, Deutschland. As a gift, not the altar itself, but the capstones of the altar of Zeus were removed to Berlin. They are still there. This is where the Third Reich emerged. Hitler may have begun in Munich, but the capital of the Reich was Berlin. That's what Hitler ended in the bunker. It is where the gate, once again, the gate between the free world and the communist world, Brandenburg Gate, the Berlin Wall was located. It was where they would exchange the spies and so forth. That was the gate. Babel. Germany remains the economic dynamo of the European Union. Capital Berlin. Many people believe that what happened with communism the Brandenburg Gate and what it was and what it represented. And also, obviously, the Third Reich, Hitler. The demonic properties of the throne of Satan from Pergamon. I can't be dogmatic about it, but I certainly... Don't dismiss it. I've always believed it could be possible. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, I believe that to some degree it is, it is probable. It is at least a factor. But you think about it. It's happened in the, in the emergence of psychology. What you see what's happened with communism and the, the, the Stalinism these things come from Pergamum. But then there was something bigger. Something bigger still happened that the Leos III of 133 BC. He and most of the pagan priesthood, just as they had previously come from Babylon to Pergamum, move from Pergamum to Rome. Now let's understand more about this. Look with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. 1 Peter 5, 13. She who was in Babylon chosen together with you, sends you greetings. And so does my son Mark. I have no doubt that the historical records of Eusebius and others, primarily Eusebius, that Paul and Peter were martyred in Rome under the reign of Nero are true. I believe in the historicity of what was written by and about Clement in Rome was, is true. Peter was not writing from Babylon. He was not writing from Pergamum. Most likely, he was writing from Rome, circa 66, was when he was martyred. He was obviously could have been 62, something time around there.
Babylon moved to Pergamum. Babylon moves again to Rome. Historically documented, Athelius III, a big event, 133 BC. I have explained this before. Let me go through it somewhat again. Sibyllinus, written 130 to 160 AD, shows that most people, most Jews, most Christians, even most Gnostics, associated Rome with Babylon. In the pantheon of Rome, were all the gods of the Roman Empire, Greek, Roman, Egyptian, as we explain in the book, The Dilemma of Laodicea, Imperial Rome didn't care what religion you had, as long as you acknowledged the emperor as the pontiff, the pontificus maximus, the bridge builder between different religions. All gods were taken and worshipped in Pergamum, but then all gods were placed in the pantheon of Rome. The one god that was a problem was the god of the Jews. The Jews made a deal, as I've explained in other teachings, where they would sacrifice for the emperor instead of to him. Now, initially, Christianity was a sect within Judaism. It was just Messianic Judaism. The believers were protected. But when Jewish believers were excommunicated from the synagogues and more and more non-Jews became Christians, the church lost its protection. It was not religio licita. It was religio illicita. It believed that the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, was the Son of God. They did not believe Kester, Weos, Deon, Caesar, Son of God. Now, we, we've explained this before on other teachings about what happened in Ephesus at the uh, promenade that leads into the market, into the Agora, and at the ruins of Ephesus. And they used the Christians as lampposts. They set them alight on either side of the promenade to illuminate the way at night into the promenade because to go into the promenade, you had to walk under a gate. And the gate said, Caesar, son of God. You were acknowledging that the sonship of Caesar is God's son by walking through that gate. Again, this was the whole idea of the Mardic and the Marduk, the, the emperor of Babylon being the son of the god and so forth. The Christians wouldn't do it. So you couldn't buy or sell unless you acknowledged Caesar as the son of God. We cannot understand the Antichrist to come and Revelation 11 and the mark of the beast unless we understand what happened in Ephesus. But we're not talking about Ephesus. We're talking about Rome. The emperor said he was the son of God. He was the pontiff, the bridge builder. Any religion you want is okay as long as you're in the ecumenical club, as long as you're in the interfaith multicultural club. Rome tried to use multiculturalism to hold together its multiple, uh, ethnic, ethnically diverse empire, particularly during times of economic and political instability. So, it goes from Babylon to Pergamum. Pergamum into Rome. <coughs> and we know from Silabinus, the early Christians, among others, thought this. <coughs> but it was particularly strong belief among the Jews. Again, my apologies to those who know this, as always, to Shabbat, roughly the 9th of August. 
The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians on Tisha B'Av, by the Hebrew calendar. The second temple was destroyed the same day, Tisha B'Av, by the Romans. So they inevitably made that connection. Particularly after 70 AD, Rome was seen as Babylon, not just by Christians, but even popularly and certainly by Jews, whether they believed or not. There has been much speculation about Revelation 17, about the harlot city on seven hills, and people have counted Rome, the Palatine, you know, and the Capitolina, seven hills on which Rome was built, going back to the tradition of Ramlos and the twins. Well, there are those who've made similar calculations about Jerusalem. You know, Mount Zion, you know, Haaretz Sofim, you know, the Mount Scopus, uh, Haaretz the Mount of Olives, what's today called the Mount of Samuel, another mount off to the northwest. Uh, others, the Hill of Evil Council. Um, then you have the question. Well, which city will house the great whore at the end in Revelation 17? Now remember, by the time John gave, was given the revelation on Patmos by Jesus in, Revel, in the book of Revelation, Jesus refers to, without mitigation, emphatically, that Pergamum is where Satan dwells. But, Peter says, Rome is Babylon. They're all cities of Satan. One may be predominant at a given time, but that does not mean <clears throat> they do not remain his cities. I've been to Pergamum. There is a demonic presence there. There is a demonic presence anywhere in the Islamic world. Uh, but it all goes back to Babylon, all of it. There are many cities that are demonic, that have a demonic presence. Salt Lake City, the Mormons being one. Obviously, Mecca, I've been to Saudi Arabia, but you can't go to Mecca unless you're a Muslim, but Mecca is obviously another. Okay, this is the reality. There are many demonic cities. <clears throat> when Paul preached the gospel, his spirit was vexed by the idols, and he said in Corinthians that idols are demons. Okay. The gods of Egypt, Moses said they're demons. Uh, but we're not talking about demons. We're talking about Satan. The European Union was established by the Treaty of Rome. Most of you know that. The countries in the European Union see ecumenism as a cultural glue to help hold these diverse countries together. We've talked about this many times. Yeah, Rome is Babylon. Rome is Babylon. Let them all have one language, Latin. <laughs> Again, it's been tried before. Okay. Have a lingua franca, Greek or English. Now it's digital. 
These things have all been tried before. But ultimately, there will be a success for a three and a half year period under the Antichrist and false prophet. I do not question that what we see happening in Iraq, Baghdad, this very day is of prophetic significance and the workings of Satan. I do not deny <clears throat> that what we see in Erdogan's government in modern Turkey, again, the workings of Satan. I do not deny what we see happening in Rome or the workings of Satan. He's operational in all these places. He's operational in all the places he was. But he's a man with multiple homes. God, however, has only ever had one earthly home. Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Hador Adonai umeulal meod beir Elohenu har kodesh. If an old salesman call a aritz, har tzion mierke tezafon a kiriat merakrav. Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God has only ever had one. And Satan wants it desperately. We are told in Daniel that he will enter the beautiful land. Does that mean he will make incursions into the church? Absolutely. But not to the negation of what it means literally and geographically. There will be a tribulational temple. I'm convinced based on Revelation 11 and looking at 2 Thessalonians and Daniel in light of Revelation 11, I do believe there will be a tribulational temple. I do believe that God will again deal with the Jews under the terms of the Torah. Although there'll be no salvation outside of Christ, there'll be under the law and the temple. And the Antichrist will have his image set up there by the false prophet. This very week, a contingent of rabbis from Israel, from the Temple Institute, have flown to Texas. You need a red heifer to sacrifice and to get the ashes to rededicate a temple. But halakhically, by rabbinic law now, at birth it cannot have any more than two non-red hairs. <laughs> The whole animal has to be inspected, every strand of hair on its body, to make sure that there are no more than two. There have been efforts to get such a heifer in Israel and in Alabama, now Texas. This parallels efforts to identify a Levitical priesthood by mitochondrial DNA identification. Again, a subject we address elsewhere. But this very week, the Temple Institute dispatched these rabbis to examine some red heifer born in Texas. They think it's a good thing. People will think it's a good thing. People already think that the Abrahamic Accords are a good thing. Now, don't get me wrong. I appreciate the support for Israel and for the persecuted church that came from Donald Trump. I really do. I consider the pres present president of the United States to be an evil man. Although I pray for him, I think he's evil. But the Abrahamic Accords... There'll be no lasting peace in the Middle East until Jesus, Yeshua, reigns on the throne of David. 
there'll be a false piece of Antichrist. And to unite these false religions, mainly nominal Christianity, and in the Middle East it's Eastern Orthodoxy and some Roman Catholicism and some other things, Coptic Church and so forth, Syrian Orthodox and so forth, but mostly they're Byzantine churches. <clears throat> uniting with Islam and uniting with Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, not scriptural Judaism, to bring in worldwide peace, this is an Antichrist agenda. Now, no, I'm not saying Donald Trump is conscious of that or that Jared Kirshner is conscious of that. I don't know. But I do know what the scripture says. These efforts to bring about a political union with the use of religion, these efforts to integrate religion, politics, and economy, like Rick Warren advocates in the UN. These efforts to bring a false peace to the Middle East without Christ, these efforts to re-enfranchise the Jews to be able to build the temple as part of a peace deal. Many people and many Christians will look with favor upon this. These things are preparing the way for the man of lawlessness. They're preparing the way for the prophecies of Revelation 11 for the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and for 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, to be fulfilled. I have no doubt. The same as the attempted reunification of the countries in the Roman Empire, trying to make the iron stick to the clay, the Treaty of Rome, I do not deny for one second. I'm convinced those things are setting the stage for what Daniel said was going to happen, and to some degree are happening already. But Satan wants the city of the great king. He wants to move the false religions of Babylon. Babylon the great, the great whore, before the Vatican, it was housed in the Lateran Cathedral in Rome. It was housed in the Zikarat of Marduk in Babylon. It was housed in the altar of Zeus in Pergamum. It was housed in the Pantheon of Rome. It will come to the tribulational temple in Jerusalem. That's where it's going to come to. These ten horns what we see in Daniel come into play in Revelation chapter 17. Daniel says these are things concerning the Jews particularly. I don't want to go into how Revelation 17 parallels the prophecies of Daniel. But we're looking at that city, that wicked woman on the hill. At different times, she's called Jezebel. There she was, seducing the servants of God in Thyatira. The great whore, Babylon the Great. She's going to come to Jerusalem and make herself at home. I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow. Nominal Christianity will agree. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, 
the World Council of Churches, they'll agree. Talmudic Judaism will agree. Even Islam will agree. Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon is a strong city. Oh, the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her. No one buys their cargoes. Well, how can this be? <laughs> They'll stand at a distance. Who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear. It doesn't say that they'll be on ships at a distance. It says they will stand. In verse 17, every shipmaster and passenger and sailor, as many as make their living by the sea, stood at a distance. They will see even at a distance. The distance from Tel Aviv, from Jaffa, from the port of Ashdod to Jerusalem is not that far. What am I saying? I'm saying that in the first century, although Rome was the Pantheon, and at that time the, uh, the Tiber River was navigable, Jesus still spoke of Pergamum where Satan's throne is. Because you may have a political, economic Rome or some other Babylon, geographically located elsewhere. Pergamum and Rome were concurrent. What Satan is going to do in Jerusalem can be concurrent with what he's going to do elsewhere, economically, politically. But to him, it's ultimately not about trade or commerce. It's about worship. That's what it's about. I do not deny that there are aspects of Revelation 17 and 18 that do not appear to fit Jerusalem comfortably. But there are other aspects that very much fit it. We talk about this, I believe, in the book um, Shadows of the Beast. Now let's look at this. Rome was Rome. The religions of Babylon came from Pergamum to Rome. That was the political, that was the economic power base. And that is where the political use of religion was in the pantheon. But Satan's throne remained in Pergamum. Satan's ultimate goal is to put his throne in Jerusalem. What I'm trying to say is people ask, is it Rome? Is it New York? <laughs> I've heard that. Is it Jerusalem? Where is it? Well, Who says there only has to be one? Jesus spoke of Pergamum as Satan's home. Peter spoke of Rome as Babylon. Satan has more than one house. And he has more than one city. The one he's looking to get is going to be Jerusalem. In the second century, the Emperor Hadrian built a temple to Jupiter whom the Greeks called Zeus 
on the Temple Mount. There have been abominations of desolations before on the Temple Mount. But nothing like what's coming. The other abominations of desolation were pagan temples like the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Aqsa, the Temple of Jupiter, something like that. No, Satan is not going to build a home in Jerusalem. He's going to renovate an existing one, the coming temple. People get excited when they see the move to rebuild the temple. Get excited because it means that Jesus is coming soon. Don't be excited about the temple being rebuilt. Read Revelation 11. Read Revelation 13. Some Christians got very excited that you had a pro-Israel and a pro-Christian president. I thank God for the good Mr. Trump did and tried to do. However, the Antichrist and false prophet, they're going to look good to people. They're going to look good to many Christians. Oh, thank God, he's the one we've been longing for. Until he gets in the driver's seat. And he's going to drive. He's going to drive all the way from Rome to Jerusalem. He drives from Babylon to Pergamum. He drives from Pergamum to Rome. Maybe a detour to Berlin. A side trip here and there. Mecca. but he knows his ultimate destination. He knows where he wants to go. He doesn't want to build his own house there this time. He's had a mosque of Aqsa. He's had a temple of Jupiter. Now he wants to move into God's place. Now, most of this will concern Israel and the Jews, ultimately. But don't forget, that wicked woman is bride. She is drunk on the blood of the saints. Yeah. Babylon, absolutely. Pergamum? Absolutely. Berlin, possibly. Rome, no question. But finally and ultimately, it will be Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries.